As taught in many American public elementary schools, the Revolutionary War was won because the Patriots were able to adapt and learn new strategies of warfare, like ducking behind stone walls and swift tactics, and through that defeated the well-trained British Army, who couldn't keep up with these new American ways. Instead, they clung to their stringent traditions built upon inflexibility and poor leadership. But is this really the full truth? Or is there more than what is written in school books from the last century? Before we dive into it all though, this video is part of the Because History Matters collaboration. This is an extensive collab between me and many other Splendid channels here on YouTube where we're exploring commonly held misconceptions of history and talking about why they matter. So how many times have you heard the common trope that colonial forces defeated the soldiers of the British Empire because they learned to adapt while the British didn't see the imperative need to change? I suspect it's rather frequent, or at least you've come across it. Well. In reality, the British Army did indeed modify how they campaigned in North America. Whilst examples are numerous, for the sake of this video, we will mostly stick to the Army under General William Howe. A good place to start is this halberd, as carried by British Line Sergeants during the early days of the American War of Independence. It's a rather medieval looking piece in the Age of Enlightenment, and though carried from the Middle Ages, it did have functionality in the Army of the 18th century. It provides a good tool to corral and redirect soldiers, makes a sergeant visible, and acts as a badge of station, which are important traits when you consider an NCO's role in controlling and training men. But even though it was a useful piece, its encumbrance for service in North America was clearly apparent. In February of 1776, before Howe's army had even left Boston, corps were ordered to outfit their sergeants with firelocks. This order armed line sergeants just as their grenadier and light infantry counterparts had been for years. Furthermore, a line officer's usual complement, as dictated in the 1768 clothing warrant, was another polearm, the spontoon. But even before the war, officers or entire regiments were instead choosing to carry fusees, which were smaller and lighter firelocks. When going up against rebel forces, the British Army was going for practicality, as can be seen. When getting to tactics, this is where many misconceptions seem to run rampant. During the conflict, the British adopted much more fluid and dynamic strategies. After the army was run through the strainer at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill, Howe evacuated Boston in March of 1776 and took the army to Nova Scotia. Here, the army was combed through to discover the problems and weaknesses that led to unpreparedness and high casualties. Even prior to that, General Thomas Gage had amended how the ranks were formed. The normal method was a three deep formation, but it seems with the lack of rebel cavalry, he chose to form them in two ranks but still chose close order as was usual. When the army landed in New York in the late summer of 1776, Howe's advances would be done at open order, while keeping the two-rank formation. This allowed his force to more easily move about the rough and broken landscape of the country. When these fluid formations combined with that of rapid light infantry style tactics, the force resembled something very different than that of the campaigns in Europe. The picturesque lines of men, like toy soldiers ready to do battle, were not the reality. Commanders were able to adapt their forces to the nature and terrain of their encounters. There was not one way of doing things, and the ability to make adjustments to how they were fighting allowed them to exploit advantages that showed themselves. If the British had been so poor at this, it doesn't seem likely that they would have won the majority of the large-scale engagements of the AWI. Even if you just looked at the clothing of the British Army at the end of the war compared to the beginning, you would clearly be able to spot the differences. Breeches would see themselves replaced by gaitered trousers. Light infantry companies would turn their waistcoats into jackets by attaching their coat sleeves. Slung belts would become even more prevalent. And these are just a few examples. These changes increased functionality for fighting in North America. The uniforms and accoutrements were adjusted to better suit the demands of the continent and leave the men better prepared for hard campaigning. It's clear that tradition was given up for practicality and that leadership looked for improvements where necessary. Not exactly the unabating loyalty to what had always been. So why is understanding all of this that important? Having a clear unadulterated picture can completely change our perception and interpretation of the conflict. Not comprehending the force that American soldiers fought against dishonors and discredits the magnitude of that struggle. Their accomplishments are dampened if we are told the narrative of an enemy ignorantly set in their ways. If we as Americans are going to continually draw comparisons between the founding of our nation and the troubles and ills of today, how can we do that if we don't have an accurate understanding of that founding? 
The answer is, we can't. Knowing the actual facts allows us to make unbiased judgments and to put the proper weight on our history. There is no doubt, the founding has an important place in the American consciousness. It's one of the things that makes Americans, Americans. That's why it's so crucial to get this right. Learning from the past makes a better future. And that can't be based on an illusion. That's really why history matters, isn't it? Thanks for watching and make sure to check out the other great videos in the Because History Matters playlist. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video very soon. Cheers.